All right, today is Wednesday, August 19th, 2020. We are speaking with Amanda Adams Louis, also known as La Photographelles, and of Cut the Rug and La Photographelles uh, Studio. Thank you so much. House music, how did you discover it? Mm, well, um, I grew up in Eastern Europe and West Africa and like outside of the country. So house music was, is what was played on the radio where I grew up when I was living in Hungary. Um, and it just was like kind of the soundtrack. It was the dominant type of music played on the radio. And I was like, I like this, what's it called? And I learned about like DJs I liked and producers. The thing I didn't know is that it's actually black American music that comes from an amazing mixture and cultural exchange between Chicago and New York um, that happened in the post-disco era. And I really thought it was European, like produced and derived music. So that's kind of my background in house. And talk to us about how did you discover house dance? Uh, that came, so I got into house music when I was about 11 in middle school and I loved it. And I went out clubbing and I grew up in Europe and I could always, I also lived in West Africa, so dance has always been a part of my life. Um, and I'd always go to the club and dance and I'd be one of the few black people and I do have rhythm, so it turned into a show. So it was always this weird tension between like, do I dance, do I want everybody to look at me today or do I just two step and act like I have no rhythm so I don't become a spectacle. So when I moved and when I, um, Part of how I chose where I was going to college was based on the nightlife available to me because I wanted to go to clubs and dance. I did graduate with the 3.0 and my resume. I'm actually a teacher now, funny enough. Um, but one of the things I really was interested in college was like nightlife because it had been such a part of my life in high school because I lived in countries that allowed teenagers to go to clubs, which is why I'm saying I was clubbing in high school. Um, and when I got here, I was like, all right, so there's black people here and I know my people dance. Where can I find people dancing to house music? <laughs> and Brian Polite actually um, took me to a party called Soul in the Hole and that's the first time I saw it. And I was like, oh, I found my place, found my spot. Um, and that I knew it was a thing um, because I know I knew there were black people that were into house music. Um, and I presume they danced to it. I did not know it was called house dance or house dance was its own subcultural community and dance style that's traveled around the world and what have you. But that was my introduction to house dance. And I haven't stopped since. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, let's take two steps back. Um, for the uninitiated, what is house music? Oh, fuck. All right. Um, to you, to there. you, to you. I'm going to give my opinion. Um, I'd like, I'm going to give my opinion. And I'm going to give the facts as I understand them and sort of mix the two because I think it's important to share both. What is house music? How would you define house music? What does it mean to you? House music means life. House music means joy. It means coming together. It means community. It means just that feeling you get when they lower the when they stop the words and they just play the bass and they kind of switch it between or when you hear a beat match and like a mix into a song and like off the first three notes you're like that's my jam house music's that feeling to me um as a musical genre house music is um what's considered post-disco music in 1979 there was a dj in chicago um that decided to burn disco records and kind of end quote unquote disco culture and there were a lot of people that agreed with them so it created a wide backlash against disco um but disco is kind of what happened i'm sorry house music is what happened when disco died and was pushed out of favor so it's i feel like the tension between disco and house is interesting because it was sort of a marketing thing but it is also a sonic shift um and with the advent of the 808 and the SL-1200s um, as major sort of tools for the production of house music. It definitely changed the sound from more of a big band, rich, instrument-infused um, musical genre to something that's made using electronic tools and devices. There are still house songs, of course, um, that have original instrumentation, but the majority of house music is made using electronic means. Um, so I think it's that too. And I think that's also important. And then house music is also um, 
a type, one of the types of electronic music electronic music that came out of the post-disco era that was created by amazing innovative brothers in the midwest my family's originally from the midwest so big shout out to um juan atkinson Der derrick may in detroit um and ron trent jesse saunders and the pioneers in chicago frankie knuckles um rest in peace mm. dropping science uh on the, along that same vein um we talked about how you discovered house dance. Describe what is house dance for the uninitiated. Oh, so we love to do it in house. Um, we love to watch video. When you ask people to talk, everybody's like, oh, shit. Um, so house dance, I would say, is an amazing bricolage of dance styles um, and cultural and club and movement traditions that have been fused together in New York City. House music is a mix of kind of cultural influences between Chicago and New York. House dance, there is a style of dance and there are, I'm not saying people in Chicago didn't dance to house music. Um, there is a style associated with them called footwork. Um, but house dance usually is referred to the various styles of dance that um, are done to house music in New York City. And house dance isn't as straightforward as like locking or popping or whacking or hip hop because it's got a very diverse soundtrack. It's not just house music, but it's new wave, post disco, we dance to disco music, um, R&B, soul. There's a lot of hip hop songs that are sort of made into house tracks. So the musical soundtrack is not just house music. Um, and there's, because house comes out of the disco tradition, there's multiple generations of people that do this dance that refer to themselves in different ways. So before house dance, there's what's called club dancing. I was listening to an, a really, really cool um, event last night called Bedtime Stories at Sin and Rose event. And they had Kervin Mark and Khalif on. And Khalif and Kervin were talking about how when they came in the scene, it was club dancing. People call themselves club dancers. Um, and that is a part of house. And then in the late 80s, early 90s, there were a group of dancers um, who were originally hip hop dancers and were in their like late teens, early 20s at the time, whom um, had aspirations to be professional dancers. And they actually were. They were part of the first generation of urban street dancers who codified social vernacular dances and organized them into choreography that was presented in concerts and on stages. So there's a vein of house dance that is a codified dance that has been included in choreography and a lot of music videos for popular entertainers uh, that perform music of multiple genres. There's a vein of house dance that is um, battled and performed in international competitions like Just to Boo, Summer Dance Forever, um, Street Star, it's a battle in Sweden, House Dance Europe. Um, and then there is the social, cultural, social vernacular iteration of House Dance that's usually done at parties and clubs and parks and beaches and on the pier. So it's different things to different people. It exists in multiple domains as a concert dance, as a social vernacular dance, but also as a competitive dance. Thank you for that. Um... Talk to us in the same vein. Talk to us about street dance and the distinction. Okay. So don't fight me, y'all. Street dance. Now, nah, this is a whole thing. Like there's street dance. And before I even say what street dance is, I'm going to say there are multiple names used to describe the set of black vernacular dances that were pioneered by black, Latin, gay, and people living in urban areas between the 1970s and the present there are there is a almost we're almost at um 50 year actually no wait 1970 to 2020 there is a 50 year history of um young men and women living in urban areas in the united states who are of boipc origins coming up with dances and gestures and movement vocabularies these dances are called street dances they're called street dances because generally a lot of them are performed in what's considered the streets so non-dance formal dance institutions most of them were not pioneered in studios they are performed on concert stages now but for a long time they were not accepted as art creative 
in within the realm of the performing arts, um, snotty accent and all. Um, so they were created in non-dance and non-performing arts spaces, um, a lot of times actually in the street, sometimes in people's sidewalks or on the block, in parks, um, on piers. Uh, I know New York City, Washington Square Park is kind of like a mecca for a lot of dancers of certain generations um, and parts of the village um, in different parts of New York City. And I know there's dancers in the Bay that have got certain neighborhoods and streets um, that they sort of recognize as areas where elements of a dance were pioneered, what have you, for the most part, because a lot of the people, especially in the 70s, and 80s, they were not letting them into dance studios and they didn't have the money. And this was considered, I mean, I'm going to be real, niggas jumping around in music. It was not considered a dance, a dance style, anything that could be codified or presented or commodified and sold for tickets for performance. Basically, you could make money off of it because it was just, you know, black people and I say this with sarcasm because it's way more than that it's um, a form of communication a method of release expression resistance protest liberation what have you but originally it was really just seen as you know ex like raw raw emotion and movement um, on black bodies and once you had um, generations of dancers beginning with the lockers and major dance groups that were able to kind of get on to late night TV shows, be a part of the choreography or choreograph, um, different entertainment and service backup dancers for acts that were performing in um, major, major, major media um, situation. So think Johnny Carson's show, Soul Train, um, backup dancers for an act during the Grammy Awards or the BET Awards, um, or some, some other sort of televised event that draws over 5 million eyeballs um, in its original sort of um, like release. Fantastic. So street dance is an umbrella term for dances um, pioneered in urban areas by black, Latin, gay men and women between 1970 and the present. And examples of street dances are popping, locking, hip hop, freestyle, house dance, footwork, vogue, whacking, um, broke up, flexing, shoe tricks. Um, some people include dance hall in it. Some people don't. That's still up for contention. Um, I say, hey, you know, we're all sort of um, the children of African descent, um, creating dances that do in their own ways include African retentions. I'm not saying they were created in Africa because they were created in the context of the United States, but there are African retentions. Um, see Robert Ferris Thomas's book for more information about different gestures and cultural cultural movements or ideas or ways of being um, that survived the transatlantic slave trade reconstruction in Jim Crow? Mm. Uh, two part question uh, on the same vein. Um, what is um, dance as protest? Uh, and then two, talk to us about your recent event. Um, I'm going to merge the questions. So dance, dance in and of itself because of the in, actually, let me start, let me start in a different way. So up until 2017, there was a set of laws that governed uh, public space and clubs in New York, and they were called the cabaret laws. They were created in the 1920s during Prohibition um, and Jim Crow to make sure that black men and white women were not dancing or socializing in the same place in like lounges, bars, and nightclubs. And they were kind of anti-miscegenation laws um, because the US government and people in charge did not want black men um, and white women, and I'm presuming black women and white people in general, um, dancing and socializing in the same space because of the power and the collective energy of dancing, um, because of the sensuality and the expression and the freedom of movement um, that's involved in dancing because of the physical interaction and intimacy and space that you take up, particularly in partner dancing, if you're dancing one-on-one -on -one with something 
else. So just in the fact that there are laws in like the nightlife capital of the whole fucking world, particularly the United States, um, had laws against dancing that were on the books from about 1924 into 2017. And they regulated clubs, but they also regulated musicians playing in clubs because that's who created the music for a long part before um, music became electronic and we had CDs and um, MP3s and USB drives to sort of circulate music. Back then you had eight tracks and records and vinyl. Um, and you also had live bands that played in these clubs and they, the cabaret laws regulated people that created music um, and that played music that people would be dancing to. So I think that speaks to the power of dance. Um, and it's been recognized throughout millennia um, as a freedom of movement of the body um, and of the soul and a way of people coming together that is very, very hard to regulate, to separate, um, and just on site, the power and the way that, not for everybody, but the way that seeing an amazing dance piece um, can change you, make you think, make you want to get involved and just change your relationship to what you're seeing. Um, I think dancing in and of itself is resistance. And that's something that's been recognized forever in many societies and cultures throughout the world. Um, street dance in particular, because it is a dance style um, and social dance and a dance music community pioneered by people of color um, outside of the confines of concert dance and formal dance studios um, that is the height of authenticity is the black body and it is also something that's created a worldwide network for young men of color of several generations to be entrepreneurs um, and be, create drive and maintain their own destiny as artists and performers um, and to not have to join the kind of the Hollywood entertainment system. It works in conjunction with that and there are people that are in it, but there are also people that are not necessarily a part of commercial choreographed dance music videos and flash mobs and commercials and that sort of thing that are stars within the scene. Um, so I think by virtue of one, the actual physical movement to the fact that it gives black men in particular agency over the, just moving their bodies to be able to do this in public to music, to create a spectacle around yourself or to educate or to inform. I think that's really, really powerful. Um, and I think particularly in times like this in the way that dance is used in uprisings and actions, um, it's used as a part of the action, but it's also used as a way of gathering space, creating energy, entertaining people that are out at the action. Because when you're standing at a protest, you're four hours in and you're kind of tired, your feet hurt, and then you see a voguing performance or you see a group of dancers stalking back and forth and you hear music and the energy changes, that galvanizes people, that gives people strength and energy. Um, and that also creates a mass of bodies that are gathered together in dance and not necessarily in looting or riding or in something violent. Sometimes dance does come into that people fight over the results of dance battles. Um, and as one of my panelists said, street dance is not an alternative um, to gang culture necessarily, um, but it is also a part because there are dances like the Crip Rock or the Sea Walk that come out of gangs and come out of gang culture and the communities um, that make up different like squads or crews or associations in the different ways that they call themselves. And part of that culture um, is dance. And some of it is music as we hear in hip hop. Um, and a lot of that is about people coming together and being creative and creating ways to call and respond and to recognize each other. I mean, even certain handshakes with gangs. Um, I've seen some of the movements in that reflected in different street dances. And then tell us about your event. So my event happened last Wednesday, August 12th. It was called Kinetic Resistance Street Dances Protest. And it was the inaugural event of Cut the Rug Institute, which is a think and do tank um, around street dance and the media um, that has covered them um, for the past 50 years. So the event looked at um, street dance as a form of protest and the role of street dance in protest. And it featured um, four panelists, amazing panelists, Cricket, Shireen, um, Dr. Shamel Bell, Dr. Imani Johnson, and our 
moderator was Dr. Naomi Bregan. Um, so I had a moderator and four panelists look at different clips of Dance's protest um, and actually select the clips that they looked at. They're about, each of the clips are about a minute. And they talked about the different ways in which street dance is used as a vehicle of protest, um, as an accompaniment to protest, as a form of protest in the movements and in and of itself. Um, and they had amazing and very divergent perspectives that complement each other but spoke to different ways in which dance is a form of resistance and a form of protest. To quickly summarize, Cricket talked about dance and moving the body um, as a form of play and the element of play, especially on black bodies and brown bodies in this time and in this country. Um, when the sort of notion of, well, black people are lazy and they need to work. And um, you know, even coming out of enslavement and bondage where our labor and our bodies were property, um, the idea of playing and choosing to create leisure time and play time for yourself, um, especially in a hyper-capitalist economy, um, is a form of protest and resistance. Dr. Shamel Bell has an initiative that she calls Street Dance Activism, um, which really takes street dance and street dance choreography and movement um, and social justice activism to the streets. So she showed us a kind of a infomercial video about street dance activism, the ways in which it works and different actions that she has produced, sponsored and been a part of um, over the past couple of years. Imani analyzed the clip of Rounds of Flame, which is a <clears throat> dance battle in New York City. And they had a dance battle um, to raise money for Black Lives Matter um, and also to hold and take up space and support Black Lives Matter during one of their protests at Union Square in July in New York City. Um, and she analyzed the clip and the power of the cipher as a way of coming together and creating collective space. Um, <clears throat> for dancers and for onlookers um, and the power of kind of circling up and the way that it works in dance, particularly with B-Boys because that's kind of her area of research, um, B-Boys and the power of the cipher um, in circular formations. And Shireen is a part of an eclectic other, um, Les Ballets Afrique, Les Ballets Afrique and she is the house of Kiki, I forgot the name before it, and she's also the Grand Marshal of another um, Vogue ballroom house. She is a Vogue and she's part of the ballroom scene on the West Coast and the East Coast. And she show, actually showed us a um, street dance protest video that she directed and also um, is featured in that she made at the request of, I believe, Oakland or San Francisco. Um, there was a social justice group that wanted to sort of call attention to a lot of the issues and also a lot of the art um, and graffiti that had been spray painted in the Bay Area. So they actually did their video on location um, and they used Vogue and Whacking and different generations of Vogue and Whackers to call attention um, to Black trans lives mattering, Black lives mattering, um, and the sort of recent changes and also speaking truth to power and documenting the current movement and what's going on. Um, I did Cricket, Imani, Shireen, Shamel. Oh yeah, I did all four. Um, so it was like four very different ways of looking and talking about street dance um, and the kind of attendant culture around street dance as a form of protest and resistance. And the panel came out of the different articles and the different dancers. Shout out to Karma um, and shout out to the gentleman that wrote Street Dance as a protest. I'm looking up his name because I do not want to screw it up. Sidney Balu, he is um, part of the House of Extravaganza, and he wrote um, Dance as Protest, Voguing for Our Lives Again, an article that looked at the way that Voguers were using their dance, their movements, and their ingenuity to raise their voices and participate in the Black Lives Matter protest earlier this year. And that article, amongst a few others, really inspired me to sort of think about, okay, so it's not just vulgars. I see b-boys, I see poppers, I see a bunch of street dancers in the streets um, in different ways. And let's talk about it. Let's think about it. Um, and let's think about street dance as a form of protest. And that's been a theme. That's part of my actual, I'm also a photographer, but um, street dance as a vehicle resistance has been a part of my artist statement. Those um, of my artist statement for over eight years. Um, and 
when I first started writing it, it was something that was like, well, that's radical and nobody's going to give you money and you sound like an angry black woman. I'm like, no, street dance is a form of resistance. Here's why. I'm not saying burn it all the fuck down, but I am saying there's different cultural forms that people use to resist the status quo. And eight years ago, that's radical. Now it's cute. Woo! Glad it's cute. Um, but that is something that I've been working with and thinking about for a very, very long time. It did not just start now. Um, and it's something that has been a part of street dance history since the lockers in 1972 and since Watt Stacks. I try not to be long-winded, but I'm sorry. I'm that girl. That was perfect. I loved it. How inclusive is house music these days? Has house music become more inclusive or less inclusive? What do you mean? Um, I felt like in the beginning, house was for insiders, for those that knew. Those that knew about the dance, the music, the lifestyle, you were about that life. Um, it's since broadened to encompass, you know, uh, other forms of electronic dance music. And then it's morphed from the club to the festival. Um, uh, in those changes, um, has house music become more inclusive or less inclusive for your perspective? I think it depends on where you are and who you are. Um, just talking about house music in general, there are different scenes and sectors and like little groups within house can music. I mean, anybody can pay money and go to a festival. And you can come out to parties in New York now. It definitely, I live in New York. I'm a part of the house community in New York. So I'm gonna talk about that. Um, I think there, even within New York City, you've got like your Pasha big band type house. You've got more of like Cielo, which has, you know, I'll have a Tiesto, but they'll also have Louis Vega on Wednesdays and like Kenny Dope um, and other smaller sort of local parties by DJs that do not have a worldwide following, but then they'll have DJs by world, world DJs with a worldwide following. So I really think it depends on the part of the house community you're talking about, um, who you are, but anybody can go to a party now. Can you, you know, have a community and sort of get in and, you know, know the barbacks and the promoters and the coat check girl? That depends. Um, I think there's still room for everybody and it's still way more inclusive than a lot of other musical scenes. Um, <clears throat> and I also think that just because of availability and like space, there's just not as much going on now as there was before and as much diversity because everything costs more. There's less club space. Um, and yes, the cabaret laws have been repealed, but um, rent kind of hollowed out what the cabaret laws did not. In terms of like Sullivan Room closed, APT closed. Um, the Good Room is still open, but there's another club in Williamsburg that everybody went to that was on Kent Ave, whose name I'm forgetting, that also closed. Um, and yeah, like the West Packing, I mean, the Meat Packing District, like it used to be like the club spot. Like this is where you could just go and like, all right, I'm gonna find something to do. It's Friday night. And now it's like lounges and expensive restaurants and like, Foo foo she she line like you can always go to the Gansevoir, but you should know somebody if you don't want to be in line for three hours. But there's still loft parties. I mean, David Mancuso's loft still going on. Black and yellow still goes on, and this is sort of pre-COVID. And then you always have like the park parties, like Fort Green. I saw it grow from two thousand people dancing that were super heads to an entire music house music festival with food and vendors in different sections. You've got the kitty corner, the family corner, the cruising corner. Um, so, you know, so, and it's mostly, it's grown amongst people of color. What you is- know, I know Chosen Few Picnic has grown. And I think with a lot of things being online and people being introduced to house music more and also house music itself being in a lot of popular music because you have a lot of DJs and producers and um, music samples put into hip hop songs from different dance music, house, techno, trance, the beats per minute of a lot of hip hop songs um, has kind of moved up and gotten faster, closer to that of dance music. And you can see over the past 10 years, the influence of dance music within hip hop. Azealia Banks' whole album. I'm in like, let's separate the music from the person here. I'm not talking about her character, but I'm talking about if you listen to her, I believe it's her only studio full length album. Um, 
you can hear house music and the kind of influence in her rapping over house beats or spitting bars over a common sort of um, vocal house, like chorus, stuff like that. What is Soulful House? It's Black People's House. Um, I think it's what we call the New York uh, iteration and variety. And I'm sorry, I can't even, when I say New York, I mean New York metropolitan area, Jersey heads, because y'all have your own sort of, it's different, but it's similar. So I'd say it's what is the East Coast, because then you got Baltimore Club. I can't even forget about Baltimore and the people that are doing it up in Miami. But it's house music that is usually produced by people of color or people that are big R&B and soul aficionados. So you hear an element, usually there's vocals of that have a soulful cadence to them. Um, sometimes there are like instrumentation from gospel organs and such. Um, and not all of it is um, includes words or lyrics, but it is always soulful in the beat. And in the production, is the soulful and that's the house music, the culture. That's a whole different story. I mean, it's a part of it, but it's it, it's more. <laughs> um, is the soulful prefix useful or not? It's necessary because it's also a polite way of saying this is the black version of house that hasn't been co-opted and turned into big band, big room popcorn. <laughs> So it's like a moniker. It's like street dance. It's a way of saying like black people created dances outside of the studio and these are their dances. We can't say it's like modern or ballet. You know, when black people create something or maintain something sort of um, that's in contrast to something that, you know, mainstream communities are doing or other communities are doing, we find a way to put a name on it to make sure that you know it's ours. In a world struggling with COVID-19, what is the role of social dancing and does um is dance music facing extinction hell no as a result of covid and social distancing no no i mean i think you know it's going to be uh, at least two years until you have like oh we have the festival in whatever town and you know grassy lawn in the uk um, but like there was just a dance festival in Croatia. Like if you look at Europe, like they're still, I mean, just talking to my friends in Europe, DJs that are based in Europe that can, you know, go from like Greece to Italy, they're still working. They still have parties. They're still playing house music. Um, the kids in Berlin <laughs> are trying to keep their nightlife together and protesting and petitioning. And you know what the soundtrack is? House music. So I think it's going to change and take a different shape. I don't know what that shape is, but I don't think it's going to die out. I think if you look at, and I'm a big history buff, but if you look at history, people have been through pandemics before. 1990, I'm sorry, 1918, you had the pandemic. People turned down till about 1920. And then when were the swing kids? When did they pop off? When, when, did, when was the height of Lindy hopping? Like, why did they have prohibition? Because people were in clubs drinking. When did the cabarets get laws get passed? 1924, which means people were in clubs and they were associating enough for people to legislate against it. In 1924, that's six years after the Spanish flu. This shit ain't going nowhere. Like, I'm so annoyed on a personal level with all of these anxious Brads, Beckys, and Karens, I'm sorry, I'm gonna say it, who do not used to not being in control of what's going on politically, socially, with their own bank accounts, with their own kids, or even in their own lives, and want to kind of forecast the death of everything. New York's dead, hip hop's dead, house music's dead, this music's dead. Nah, shit ain't dead, particularly shit that black people create. It's not gonna die out. Hell no, it's not going anywhere. It will shift and change and evolve as things do in life. None of us know what that looks like because most of us weren't alive for 1918 to see how society came back and eventually recovered. But human beings are social animals. We gonna get back together. Like, I, I I, just, I'm sorry, I have no patience for, it's all gonna die. Oh my God, I'm gonna go live in a bunker in the suburbs. All right, go do that. Maybe rent will be cheaper in the city. And then real culture will come back. How important is a DJ residency at the, in these days? 
What do you mean, like in COVID? Or just in general, um, for say, say, forget about the whole COVID situation. How important, to, how important is the notion of have a DJ having a residency? Does it matter? Does it not matter? Or do you just go out to dance versus are you going out to hear a particular person because they play this sound at this club and it builds their career? I definitely think residencies are important. I think the nature of them has changed um, because I also think what you can do with the residency, you can also, if you already have, like for example, Casamina. Bef like he's been podcasting since 2007 and I've been listening to, I mean, and even Lars Baronroth and Deeper Shades of House and they built a following and they kind of created a virtual residency for themselves using their podcast. But it, they also play in parties um, and have their own parties and do have residencies. Um, so I think it's, I mean, I do think it's helpful to, at least as a dancer, I like when DJs have their own parties and I know, okay, this is their take on the music. This is a, you know, kind of where they'll go and the type of music journey they like to take the crowd on. Um, and it's also, you know, a reliable, consistent event I know happens every other Wednesday or once a week or what have you. Um, and it's also a kind of, it's like a community center, like a party. Um, and it's how DJs create a community around themselves. I'm gonna use Chris Annabel. shout out to my big brother, Chris and Afrokinetic. Um, I, he actually gave me my first job as an event photographer. Um, so I watched him build that party and that community up. Um, and he had so many different iterations of it. There was Carmina Soul. Now he's got a live stream on Sundays. Um, from 5 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Twitch, AFK International. Um, he had his residency at LeBain. He started out at Sputnik, which is like a basement in the Taffy Lofts in Bed-Stuy, um, and grew that and took it, you know, different countries, different cities. He's done stuff in Canada um, and like Scotland and Mexico and California um, and has grown that. Like, I mean, I've worked with him for 15 years. And I've watched him build, grow, you know, shift the community. Um, but he did keep a consistent, um, you know, party in an event. And he's an amazing DJ himself. So it's like, I know if I go to Afrokinetic, I'm going to have a good time. The music's amazing. And it's going to be a bunch of stuff that I might know, but also things I don't know. And the way that he puts them together is the fun part of the journey. So I think it's important for DJs to create a space where people can come hear them. I think the way that that happens is definitely changing and shifting, but it is important. Uh, I mean, it's a lesson that I learned that I sort of ignored even in what I do in terms of creating a consistent place for people to know and to recognize you. And it's something that I've admired that you did with Bounce. Well, thank you very much. Uh, which country or city has the healthiest house music scene and why? Because you've no, traveled around the world. Question. You've traveled around the world. Question. I need it like, that's not a fair question. Well, the thing is, I'm, the reason I'm asking I'm you this is because you're, because you're very well traveled. So it's like, it's not, it's, you've, you've been around the world. So you've seen the scenes in different cities and have, have context to compare and contrast. Um, so from your perspective or from your opinion, where do you feel, you know, except, you know, COVID has shut everything down, but say pre-COVID, from what you've seen, which country or city has the healthiest house music scene and why? I'm going to answer the question in a different way. Ooh, okay. In terms of my favorite place in the world to party, New York City. And it's, very, it's a very simple reason. There's not too many other places where, and I'm not even saying I'm a virtuosic professional dancer, but I know I can go to most clubs, like house music clubs or parties here and dance and be in community with other people dancing who can also dance well. Basically me dancing to house music does not turn into a spectacle. I've made spectacles on mad continents. And I'm again, not a professional dancer. I'm good at it, I'm on rhythm. I think I'm creative with my shit, but I'm not, you know, one, I'm not a Nene, I'm not a Marjorie, rest in peace, I'm not a Kim Holmes. These are three women who are professional, amazing house dancers who earn a living from judging and performing and educating people and teaching people to do these dances. I'm not them, they can all outdance me. But yet, 
I also personally hate people staring at me when I dance. I go out to have fun, do what have you. I see a cutie, great. Obviously, there's going to be some good smoke there, but I don't really go out to entertain drunken club goers and just people stopping and staring. It's one thing to be like, yo, I respect your dance when you're in the, there's a difference between the eyes on you and a cypher and when you are the only person that can dance with some soul in a venue and then everybody stopping like, let me go look at this black girl or black man. I mean, it happens to a lot of people of color and even people on the gender binary, um, you know, our trans brothers and sisters, it happens to them too. But and personally to me, it's just annoying. I come to dance and to feel the collective energy, not to be a fucking spectacle. So that's why New York's my favorite place because it's, I know I won't, I won't be a spectacle unless I choose to go in the cypher, which is a whole different situation because that is a quasi performative space on the dance floor. Oh, perfect. That, that's a perfect lead into my next question. Um, what the hell happened to New York besides Giuliani? So, and the reason what I'm, where I'm Rant. going with that was that, huh? Rant. Unpack that for people that don't know. When it costs more and you have to pay more in rent, you have to work more and it, okay, how do I put this? The cost of living in New York has gone up exponentially post 2010 for a variety of reasons. The majority, the main factor in your everyday person, I'm not talking about the billionaires here, is the cost of rent. Normally rent should be about 30% of your total, you know, household monthly take home earnings. It's like 60, 70% of regular middle class. I have a job. I make between 35 and 74 K a year. People, if that takes up 70% of your income, your working situation, your relationship to money and financing is different. It's also a lot more stressful because salaries are not rising with the cost of living. That's simple economics. So because people have to work harder, work longer, do more overtime, there's less time to go out and to go dancing and to go to clubs. It's also demographic shifts. I don't, I got here in 20, 2004, I did not grow up in America. So I grew up hearing house music and seeing DJs. I knew who Louis Vega was, what have you. Um, looking around at people my age, I just turned 34 last Saturday. Um, there are some, shout out to Deborah, um, who know about house music and whose parents sort of were into it and transferred it to them. There are others who think it's just gay, big room club, you know, loud, like annoying, what have you. So there's like a lot of perceptions about it that have sort of impeded it from being transferred, soulful house music specifically, to a new younger generation. It has always been a huge factor in the ballroom scene and in the black gay community and black trans community because it is their music. There are young black gay and black, um, <clears throat> trans folk whom I see coming out and innovating and what have you. Um, but I don't see as many just across the board people that are not part of specific communities that have a c historical relationship to house music, participating and innovating and doing new things. When you do see them, it's usually on the dance, street dance side, which is a different community from the underground dance music community. And it's usually people that are not from the United States. I think there are multiple reasons for this. Um, also, you have to be 21 to get in clubs. So by the time you would even really legally be able to kind of experience the height of this, you probably are into something new. And then it's also, and I say this as a high school teacher, young people do not care about what their elders, for the most part in this kind of generation, are into until they see a connection like, oh, I like this song and it's sampled from an old song. Let me go check out the old song. But if you just tell them, oh, you know that song you listen to like it used to be this they'll sort of ignore you they kind of have to find it out for themselves um and that's a sense of agency and just kind of ways of being in the world and also being the generation that you know knows nothing before smartphones um so i think that 
it's really, really hard to transfer this community because it is a nightlife club based thing. Um, I think that it's never really reached commercial popularity um, on a national scale regionally. You know, the, yes, it was the, not, the late 80s, early 90s was the kind of golden age of house. But I, I, I mean, and I say to people that say that, yes, it was, but was that all over America? Or was that in certain regional areas? So I think it's been transferred in some ways, but not in a lot of other ways. And then there's, if you do find it, you find the right party, you get there, people respect longevity in the house and you can't just show up once and expect anybody to give a goddamn about you people might start to talk to you if they see you for two years straight. Might start to talk to you. Check the conditionals in that sentence. So it takes a while. It is a subcultural community. There is an unspoken hierarchy, um, you know, power structure. People gonna hate me for saying this, but there is. Just try to get try to get into shelter with a bottle of water and tell me there's not hierarchy and power structure. <laughs> Um, what you gonna call it? And there's also certain ways of being, certain forms of community respect. It is definitely a legacy. Elders are celebrated as they should be community. Um, so taking all that into account, it is very hard as a young person to come into this if you do not have a guide or a mentor. Because a lot of the things I just said will never be spoken to you. They just are. Like why, you know, and then, or even the fact that like, if you, you know, kind of are starting to learn house dance and this happened to me, people will come up to be like, yo, you know that move you did? That was cute. And I'm like, wait, what? Niggas are checking for me? Yes and no. I've also gotten feedback on, you know, this is like when you go to the floor, you need to get there quicker. Here's how you do it. You know, you should get back into shape. It was true though. I didn't need to get in shape. It was true. Um, but and that, you know, it can, can come across as abrasive and rude, but it's really people like, no, I see you, you know, young person. This is how you step your game up. And we are checking for you, but we're not necessarily going to open, acknowledge, openly acknowledge you till we see you've demonstrated you are actually serious about being a part of this community, which is a good check and balance and it keeps a lot of bullshit out, frankly. But you also, as a, you know, as somebody, have to have the stamina um, to live through that. Yeah. Thank you. That was fantastic. All right. Have a good one. Bye. All right, okay.